In this video I want to go over the counterintuitive idea of functions and polynomials making up a vector space. And so most people when they're introduced to vectors are introduced in terms of what are called coordinate vectors which is that idea of there being, so control that a little better, there being this sort of space here and we have these these basis vectors, uh, and then we can make a vector that's sort of an arrow pointing in some direction uh, using these basis vectors. And so that's the, that's the uh, sort of familiar notion of vectors just being something with a magnitude, which is the, the uh, size of the arrow, and a direction, which uh, you could say is sort of the the angle here between uh, maybe oops, maybe some some uh, coordinate system here. So we could say that this is a a vector uh, and has a magnitude that's the length of the arrow and a direction that is the angle with respect to some coordinate system. But vector spaces or vectors in uh, vectors themselves are uh, actually this is just a this is a specific a specific sort of uh, I guess representation of of vectors specific uh, rep rep of vectors and vectors are actually something a bit more general uh, I'm not going to go too deeply into sort of the um, the abstract algebra of vector spaces and sort of building them up from groups to uh, sort of going from uh, groups to rings to fields uh, and so you can look into this and each of these things sort of add more structure onto the thing uh, but um, I will uh, I guess say that a field is just something that um, that has both addition and subtraction, or, or addition and uh, and uh, multiplication rather, such that any two elements of the f of the field. So if if A and B are elements of our our field, then A plus B is also an element. Uh, of our field and a times b is also uh, the product of a of any two elements of our field is also an element uh, of our field here um, and so there are other things but uh, this is sort of the thing that I wanted to uh, at least point out what a f in in terms of what a field is and so we can then have what's called a, a vector space. And a vector space uh, is something where if we take any vectors uh, inside our vector space, and I, I will use this vector notation, even though this arrow kind of uh, reminds one of this idea of vectors with a magnitude and direction, uh, I just don't feel like doing like the, the bold letters for vectors. So that's often what you will see in books is uh, you'll see the, the bold letter as the vector and then uh, you will have sort of the regular letters as the scalars. Uh, but anyway, a vector space will if has vector uh, addition and it has scalar multiplication. So if we add two vectors, we get another vector. And if we multiply our vector by uh, by some scalar in our field uh, that will give us uh, that will give us another another vector uh, and so uh, with this idea what we can do is we can say that um, uh, we can say that let's say we have our 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 vectors v1 and v2 and v3 uh, so on uh, and so on going off to uh, I mean I guess you could go to infinity but we'll just say finite v 
n uh, are all uh, these vectors are all elements of our our vector space and then we can have uh, these scalars so k1 k2 k3 uh, so on going up to k n uh, so these are elements of our our uh, scalar field here uh, and the field can uh, well in quantum mechanics for instance so you'll find uh, the complex field uh, so the real number field is is something uh, it could be as well but anyway it's just uh, so this um, I'm, I'm not good at drawing sort of the um, the fancy letters used to represent the fields, but uh, this could be the r the real field or the complex field or uh, any kind of field. And so, uh, using these vectors that are elements of our vector space here, and these uh, these element or these uh, scalars here that are members of our scalar field here, uh, then we can uh, we can do a, a uh, linear combination. So K1, K2 times V2, uh, and so on, uh, going up to Kn times uh, Vn. And so this is what's called a, a linear combination, combination. And so the set of all linear combinations uh, of our vectors uh, creates a subspace of our, our, vector, our vector space. Uh, and so we can say that that is U is a, a uh, so there's the little, um, this little subspace uh, of our, our vector space uh, and U is spanned spanned by uh, by the v1 and the v2 uh, going off to the vn so our our vector space uh, uh, we can we have these elements of our vector space and then we when we take a linear combination of them that creates a a sub space of our vector space so u is a a subspace so u is a subspace of v uh, and so anything that um can be well anything that is a linear combination of th of these uh will generate well will be a member of our our uh, subspace U of V. And so spanning essentially just means that, uh, that if we have some, some uh, space here, uh, then we can get to anywhere inside this space uh, using a linear combination of these. So if this uh, is sort of representing our, our uh, well, I guess we could say that this is our vector space V, and then this down here is U. So using linear combinations, we can get, we will get anywhere in U, and uh, and uh, only places in U. And so that, uh, so it is also closed uh, under addition. Um, so. The fact that you can get to anywhere in U tells you that it spans. The fact that you can get to only places in U tells you that it is closed uh, under under addition. All right, and so the other thing we want to talk about uh, is um, so if if we have our uh, our K one V one plus K two V two uh, and so on, going up to our k n v n. Uh, if we have that equal to zero, and and not all k 
hey are equal to zero, uh, then this is what is called linearly dependent. Dependent. Um, and so that means that at least one of our vectors, uh, so at least one of our vectors, so we'll call that v i, at least, at least one, at least one uh, can be represented as a, as a, as a linear combination of the others combo of others. And so I'm going to actually uh, try and show this a little more intuitively using the coordinate idea of vectors. Uh, and so, uh, like I said, this is, this is very general, but uh, I think the more intuitive way of thinking about it is in terms of our coordinate vectors. So let's say we have uh, a two-dimensional vector space here uh, with E1 and E2 as our bases, as our basis vectors, uh, and we have some vector here, we'll call it V1. Uh, we can represent that as a linear combination uh, of, of these scalars multiplied by the um, by the basis vectors. So it's essentially saying, so this one is saying how many E1s do we have to make up this uh, component of the vector? And this one, this K is telling us how many E2s we need for this component of it. Um, and so you can imagine uh, that if we then have our our basis here with E1 and E2 uh, and say we have this vector V1 here which is um, which as I said is equal to K1 E1 plus K2 E2 uh, we could then maybe write, draw in sort of another vector here, and we'll call this V2. Uh, and we can say that this is a linear combination of, uh, well, we'll say that K3E1, because it's not going to have the same component as V1, plus K4E2. But then if we also say that this is plus uh, plus K five V one. So we are also saying that it has some component that is represented by this V one here. Uh, well, this V one we know is can be represented as a linear combination of just E one and E two. So what that means is that we could say that V two uh, is equal to our K three E one plus k four e two plus uh, plus this uh, this k one e one plus k two e two because that's what the the uh, v one was um, and so then we could sort of move things around uh, we have our v two here we could say that uh, so we can combine the e one term so we could say e one times k3 plus k1 plus e2 times uh, our k4 plus k2. And then we could just define these as some other constant. So we'll call that maybe k, so I'm up to k5 there. So k6, which means we'll call this k seven uh, and so we could just say that v2 is k6 e1 plus k7 e2 and so uh, we see that we can just uh, we can if we have some other uh, some other uh, part of our basis here which can be represented as a linear combination of 
of this basis, then we can just sort of uh, simplify this away and just end up getting everything in terms of our actual uh, bases here. Um, and so we can see there that uh, that that if well I said earlier that uh, that this that we have this uh, k this uh, k this linear combination here equals to zero uh, if not all the k are equal to zero then it is linearly dependent because you could imagine uh, that that we could have that we could have v or v two our v2 uh, equal to zero just because uh, just because we have for instance um, our our v our v1 being equal to uh, being equal to I guess minus um, minus the k3 e1 uh, and I'll put a parenthesis here on that plus k 4 e 2 uh, and so th if this is the case this uh, the k's don't have to be zero here uh, they don't have to be zero here so we could uh, we could say that k 1 e 1 uh, plus k 2 e 2 is equal to minus k 3 e 1 plus k 4 e 2 uh, and so in this case, we don't have to have the k's being equal to zero because we have this other thing here, this v1 that we are using uh, to represent our v2 um, is just the opposite of, of, uh, of these, um, so these components of our, our v2. And so the only way that if it's linearly dependent that v2 2 could be equal to 0 is if we uh, say we take our k6 and k7 would be if k6 e1 plus k7 e2 uh, k6 would have to equal k7 which would have to equal 0 to make this true uh, and so that's um, all just to show once again that um, that if if we can't have this then we have a linear dependency there uh, and this uh, only if if uh, all of the k's are equal to zero would this uh, end up being true if we are uh, linearly independent uh, and so um, and so that's uh, this is all kind of a long winded way of saying that our vectors our vectors our vectors v1 uh, v2 v3 uh, and so on up to vn um, are can be called uh, can be called bases or basis vectors uh, if if uh, it spans uh, so if it spans uh, vector space vector space uh, and if they are linearly dependent dependent um, and so this allows us to uh, to get our our basis vectors, um, but we are still in a place where we could say if we if we say we have a uh, a space that's that's the uh, real numbers uh, three dimensions, we could have e one equals one two three. Uh, so kind of going back to our coordinates here. In, our coordinate sort of representation and e2 equals 1 0 2 and e3 equals uh, equals say 3 2 1 so these would be uh, these would be valid bases uh, but we see here that um, 
that if we if we take for instance the the dot product of e1 and e2 uh, that that equals 1 times 1 so 1 times 1 plus 2 times 0 plus 2 times 0 uh, plus 3 times 2 plus 3 times 2 uh, and that equals uh, 7 um, and if we did the same thing for every combination so dot product with e3 uh, I believe we'd end up getting 12 and e2 dot e3 we would end up getting 5 and so this tells us uh, that we are not uh, not orthogonal. Uh, so what we want is so that if we have any E uh, dot with any J that it equals zero if I is not is not equal to J. So this uh, right here would be uh, what we would call um, orthogonal and so we can see, uh, so if we just sort of think about the, um, the geometric interpretation of the dot product, uh, what we would have over here, and uh, I'll just use two dimensions. So if we have something like this, E1 and E2, or E2, the dot product is sort of taking the shadow of this one over this. So we have uh, our theta here. And so what it is, is we have our E1 times E2 times cosine of theta. Well, if we have something like this, where this is a right angle, uh, E1 and E2, then the E1 times E2 times cosine of 90 degrees so cosine of 90 degrees is 0 so this would equal 0 uh, and this um, can be generalized so we can have this be in sort of uh, any number of dimensions uh, but the idea is just that if you have the dot product uh, of two vectors that it equals zero or I guess maybe a better way uh, I guess this is sort of the better way that I showed it e i dot e j equals zero uh, if if uh, j does not equal i and so that is sort of uh, what we want to get to uh, well this is sort of imposing another bit of structure on it, I guess you could say. So up here we said that we could, these are bases if it spans the vector space, uh, meaning that, that um, any place in our vector space can be, uh, can be represented by a linear combination uh, of, of uh, the, these vectors within it. Uh, and if they are linearly uh, linearly, um, so this should be in independent, linearly independent, um, which, like I said, uh, means that they that th there nothing in there can also be represented as an, a linear combination. Everything, uh, everything can be represented as a linear combination like this, and none of the elements are are any other or any other linear uh, combination. Um, so everything is sort of uh, uh, irreducible. Uh, it's down to this sort of irreducible form here. That is when it is linearly independent. And then we are adding this orthogonality onto it, which, as I said, is saying that um, any two of the basis vectors, so these are, we're still talking about basis vectors, so the bases of our vector space. Uh, the If we do the dot product um, of any of them, or inner product, uh, if you will, the, then that will equal zero if they are not the same thing. Uh, we can even 
add further structure and say that um, that e i dot e j equals one if uh, i does equal j, and this would be called uh, ortho normal. But I'm not going to get into that so much uh, in this video. Uh, what I wanted to get to was this idea of uh, of an orthogonal basis um, of a vector space. Uh, and then that will allow us to get to um, this idea of a function being orthogonal. So an orthogonal, an orthogonal function. And so up here, remember we said uh, that two vectors are orthogonal if we take the dot product and it equals zero. When we do a function, what we actually do is we take uh, we take the integral from a to b uh, of two functions. Uh, so rather than two of these uh, coordinate vectors, which is what I was using for illustrative purposes, we take two functions, uh, dx, and then that equals zero. Um, but we can see how this is very similar to the dot product, because the dot product uh, so if we have uh, a times b, the dot product would just be a1, b1 plus a2, b2 plus, uh, and so on, off to, um, off to a, n, b, n, uh, if these are n-dimensional vectors. And we can see something similar when we are looking at orthogonal functions, because... Um, an integral is just a is just a, a sum, a continuous sum, uh, and so we could imagine that um, that if we're going from a to b, that uh, that we could represent this uh, sort of like this f a times f of a times g of a plus f of a plus uh, uh, I guess we could say maybe delta x, so some some very small x, uh, well, an infinitesimally small x times g of a uh, plus some infinitesimally small x, um, and then we could do uh, plus f of a plus, uh, we could say that some infinitesimally small x plus another infinitesimally small x times g of a plus an infinitesimally small x plus an infinitesimally small x uh, and so on going up to uh, f of b uh, times g of b um, and so obviously there would be sort of an, an infinite number of sums between here because that's what an integral is. But we can see that it, it takes on a very similar sort of thing as the dot product uh, when we do this integral of the, uh, the product of two functions here because we're just adding up uh, each little part of it. So if we have a function that looks like this, say, uh, and then we have maybe another function that looks like this, uh, where this one is f of x and this one is g of x. We're just adding this part, then this part, then this part, uh, and we'll say that this uh, is zero right here. This part, and we're just adding up everything under here. And so we can see that in this case, uh, so if we say that this is b right here and this is a right here, we take the integral from a to b of our f of x times g of x. That's going to equal zero because we're taking, uh, so if we say that this is sort of symmetric across the zero, it's like we're taking, um, it's like we're, we're adding or, or we're multiplying this and then adding it to the next one 
and the next one and the next one and uh, we end up with uh, something that is zero because uh, as we multiply these together and add them uh, we will well actually I think that doesn't work for this one I think if we multiply those together we would probably end up getting something that looked like that so let's see positive times negative no that would still be negative so I, th I think it still works uh, well no because we'd probably end up with something that looks more like this because uh, uh, and so it would actually end up being something negative um, uh, so I think uh, so maybe a better a better thing would be if we have um, if we have our zero here, if we have some function like this, uh, and then this one is maybe just uh, something that looks like like this. If we added, if we did the uh, the integral of those, uh, where say this one is f of x, and this one is g of x. So f of x times g of x that that would equal um, that would equal zero. But anyway, the idea is that we are uh, multiplying these and then adding them. So you see here, uh, if we if we sort of added each of these together, what we would end up getting is uh, is something. So these would constructively interfere. So we'd end up with something that looks like this uh, and so um, then when we add this all together uh, so this part here is is positive this part is negative so that would end up being equal to zero so yeah this one this uh, sort of function here should uh, work for that but the idea here that I wanted to show is that we can think of this uh, orthogonal this uh, orthogonality of a function similar to the way that we do uh, the dot product up here in that we are just uh, multiplying the first thing and then adding the, the second thing just like we are with the dot product uh, and then doing that um, over the entire uh, the entire section from A to B and so uh, and so this sort of leads us to uh, where we are eventually, well, I guess this is getting to it, uh, is the Legendre polynomials. Legendre polynomials, which uh, polynomials obviously are a type of function. Uh, so if we take the integral from minus 1 to 1 of uh, one of the Legendre polynomials uh, times some other Legendre polynomial um, dx. I think I've been forgetting to put dx up here. So this this should also have a, a dx and a dx. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this will um, this actually ends up being equal to uh, two over 2n plus 1 times the uh, Kronecker delta. Uh, so the Kronecker delta, the Kronecker delta uh, is equal to 0 uh, if m does not equal n. And so the Legendre polynomials satisfy this idea of, of, uh, of being orthogonal. And so um, to look more deeply, I guess, into uh, polynomials being orthogonal, uh, we can say that a polynomial, a polynomial um, represented by uh, P of X um, being equal to uh, the summation uh, from N equals 0 to to n uh, of a sub n times x to the n. Uh, so this is a, uh, it's, uh, is a linear, a linear combo. 
a linear com combination uh, of 1x, x squared, x cubed, uh, and so on up to xn. Uh, and so we can say that these are the, the basis. This is the, the basis uh, the basis of the of the uh, of the space of polynomials, and so um, and so th we can actually uh, orthogonalize our our uh, our basis here. So we can orthogonalize our basis. So if we say that. Um, that we have, uh, let's say, let's say we have our q uh, naught of x is equal to one, and our q one of x is equal to x, and our q two of x is equal to x squared, and uh, so forth. Uh, so we want to convert these into uh, into into orth orthogonal polynomials. And so to do that, what we do actually is uh, use this thing called the Gram-Schmidt process. Uh, and so we want some, uh, some orthogonal polynomial here uh, some particular k, k, the kth polynomial here will be equal to the kth uh, uh, polynomial of this type up here minus the summation of uh, sort of the inner product of our, our kth uh, polynomial of this type up here with p, with the nth uh, the nth polynomial here uh, over the uh, the nth polynomial times the nth polynomial uh, and then multiplied by the uh, the nth polynomial here uh, and hopefully this will make a little bit more sense here uh, so so uh, what we have is um, uh, so this denominator, for instance, uh, is going to be uh, is going to be from negative one to one uh, of of p n uh, of x p m of x uh, d x. Uh, so that will equal zero if n does not equal m. Um, and so what we can do is, uh, if we want to find the the first uh, the first polynomial that is uh, in our orthogonal basis, so we'll have p one of x will equal uh, will equal. Let's see. Uh, so we're going to say that um, that p naught of x is equal to to one. Uh, and so we're going to do our p1 of x equals q1 of x uh, minus, and this will be uh, this will be the q the q1 of x uh, times that's that should be a q right there q1 of x p uh, p n of x over uh, p n of x times p n of x, uh, and uh, I said times, but it's actually sort of the dot product, and we'll see what that means. And this will be uh, times the uh, the p naught. So these these should all be p naught in here, uh, and times p naught of x. And so this will equal, so q1 of x was x uh, minus, and uh, 
minus, and the the sort of inner product of this will be the integral from minus 1 to 1 of x dx, uh, because, uh, because these p naughts are 1, and this q is our, our x, uh, this q1 is our x, so we're putting an x there, and our p naught is 1, so uh, we could put a times 1 in here, but uh, I'll just leave it in the simpler way, and then uh, this would be from minus 1 to 1 of 1 times 1, so we can just do dx like this. Uh, and so what we end up getting is x minus, uh, and if we take the, if we do the antiderivative of this, we will end up with 1 half x squared over x. Uh, and then this part right here, uh, this part right here, we want to uh, we want to evaluate that from minus 1 to plus 1. And that will be uh, 1 half uh, times 1 squared minus 1 half times minus 1 squared uh, all over 1 minus uh, negative 1. Uh, so this just ends up being 0 over 2. So what we get is x minus 0 over 2 equals x. And so our our p, our first, uh, well, I guess we could say the first one was p naught, and we said that p naught of x was equal to 1. Uh, we can now say that our p1 of x is equal to x, uh, and I will show this for uh, for p the second one as well. So that would be p two of x is equal to so x squared. That was our uh, this is our our q two of x if you remember uh, minus, and so uh, it's a summation. Remember, so we have to do the first one minus one to 1 of x dx over the integral from minus 1 to 1 of dx uh, and then we will have uh, we will have uh, minus so minus um, <clears throat> so remember this is a summation right here so we have we have this right here which is from the first one uh, and then we have the next one here which is putting uh, the x squared in for, for q and then putting the uh, p1 in for, our, uh, for our, our pn up there. So that ends up being the integral from minus 1 to 1 of x squared times x. So x squared being our, our uh, q2 and our x being our p1 uh, dx over the integral from minus 1 to 1 of x squared. Uh, well, it would it would be, because we're using p1, it would just be x times x. So I'll just make that a little bit more explicit there, dx. Uh, and then remember, this had that, uh, had the 1, the p, the p naught out here, but this is the p1 here, so it has another x there. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the math here, but what we will end up getting is um, is uh, it'll be x x squared. Uh, so it'll be let me see x squared uh, minus one half, and this is often then represented as one over three, uh, and then. 3x squared minus 1. And so we can say that our, our p2x is equal to 1 third uh, 3x squared minus 1. Uh, and our, our p4, uh, our p4 here of x is going to be uh, 1 over 35 uh, 
35x to the fourth minus 30x. Uh, ooh, I, I skipped p3, so I'll put that in in just a second. Uh, squared plus 3 uh, with p3 of x uh, being 1 fifth uh, 5x cubed minus 3x. Uh, but anyway, these all right here are the Legendre polynomials. And the Legendre polynomials are, uh, are orthogonal, 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 uh, well, they're an orthogonal basis an orthogonal basis uh, spanning, so spanning uh, space of polynomials, polynomials. And it will be polynomials of, of, of degree, degree less than, uh, I think it's less than or equal to n. And so we could have a space uh, that is just the first four Legendre polynomials. So the, the highest one is P4 of X, which, uh, as we showed up here, is 1 35th times 35X to the fourth minus 30X squared plus 3. So uh, fourth degree uh, so this is a fourth degree polynomial. It's the highest one. So this would, uh, w so if we had the polynomials up to uh, up to the fourth Legendre polynomial, that would mean that um, that we have a polynomial space uh, that we have a polynomial space of uh, of n dimensions. So so this would be sort of a 4D polynomial, polynomial space. And so that is, uh, as I said, so the kind of to uh, get our bearings here, what we did is we took this basis, uh, this basis of the polynomial space, where it's just 1x, x squared, x to the third, so on up to x to the n, uh, and we used this uh, this Gram-Schmidt process to uh, sort of transform them into polynomials that are uh, that can be used as an orthogonal basis uh, spanning a space of polynomials. And so, what we're going to see in future videos um, when we uh, get to solutions of the Schrodinger equation is we will see that the the Legendre polynomials so our p n uh, so if these are Legendre polynomials these will act as sort of a a basis for uh, solutions solutions to the the Schro the Schrodinger equation. And so uh, we know that our Schrodinger <coughs> equation, the, the functions uh, that we get as, as uh, solutions to the Schrodinger equation uh, are, can be represented as a linear combination. Uh, so A naught psi naught uh, plus a1 psi 1 plus a2 psi 2 and so on. So our solutions can be, um, are, are these linear combinations of functions. Uh, so these, the, the psi's are, are functions, that, which is why they're called the wave function because they are, are functions uh, which give us waves, uh, the functions that, that um, are functions that are, are waves. And what we will find is that the, 
the uh, bases uh, will be these uh, these uh, sort of orthogonal polynomials. So the basis of our, our wave function, uh, the linear combination of our wave function will be these, uh, these orthogonal polynomials. So it'll be, you know, something roughly, roughly, very roughly, like a, a naught times the, uh, the, I guess, zero with polynomial, uh, Legendre polynomial, uh, a1 times the uh, first Legendre polynomial, a2 uh, times the uh, second Legendre polynomial, and so on. And so that is going to be, that is sort of where these um, orthogonal polynomials end up showing up in our uh, in our solutions to the Schrodinger equation, uh, which we will get to in future videos. Uh, but anyway, I hope this uh, sort of long video here, uh, sort of just going over this idea of of um, this idea of orthogonality of functions, uh, and in particular polynomials. Uh, was somewhat enlightening. So the take-home message is essentially that uh, that we can have a basis, a basis if we have uh, vectors, vectors which uh, which span span the space the space, uh, and which are linearly. Inde independent, independent, uh, and then we can uh, have an orthogonal, orthogonal basis uh, if uh, if any if any of our two vectors, uh, well, our our basis vectors. So if we have our uh, let's let's use this notation e i uh, dot e j equals zero uh, if i is not equal to j. Uh, and the same goes for these Legendre polynomials. So if we if we have say from negative one to one uh, say of of p uh, of say the the second Legendre polynomial times the uh, third Legendre polynomial dx, this will equal zero. Uh, and so we have kind of the same thing where we can form an orthogonal basis of functions. Uh, uh, so the function, so functions uh, are vectors. Uh, so they, in the, in the more abstract way of thinking about it, they behave like vectors, uh, they satisfy the the axioms of what it requ of what is required to be a vector, uh, and we can have uh, an orthogonal uh, an orthogonal basis here, orthog orthogonal basis of polynomials or functions here, polynomials. Um, so we can have the, this orthogonal basis of polynomials the same way we can have an orthogonal basis of, of the sort of familiar vectors uh, as, as coordinate vectors like, like E1, E2, like this. Um, but instead of, of, um, instead of having something that looks like this, it actually looks more like this. So these are the first 10 uh, Legendre polynomials right here. And if you graph them between negative one and one, so this right here is on, uh, on Wikipedia. You can check this out on Wikipedia. These are the, the different um, functions graphed between uh, negative one and one. Uh, and if you took, if you multiplied these and took the integral, uh, if, if the numbers were not the same, you'd get zero. If they were the same, uh, 
you would get, um, so what was that? I think, yeah, it was like 2 over 2n plus 1. Uh, and so this is uh, sort of what the, the uh, what they, this is, I guess, what you would, the basis of these polynomials would look like. Whereas, like I said, the, the basis uh, in coordinates it looks more something like this. Uh, so it's 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 a little bit more uh, uh, confusing, at least it was to me at first, how you can have orthogonal functions uh, where polynomials are a a type of of function. Um, but anyway, uh, like I said, this here is kind of the take home message of this, uh, and so hopefully that will help. Uh, some of the solutions to the Schrodinger equation, which we will look at uh, in future videos. I hope they make a little bit more sense. Um, and in the next couple videos, I am just going to look at uh, how things like the the Legendre, the Legendre polynomials, uh, so Legendre poly, polynomials, are solutions are solutions uh, to uh, a, a type of second, uh, second order ordinary differential equation. Uh, so that was uh, sort of of the form of dy over dx uh, plus uh, p of x dy over dx uh, plus q of x y equals zero. So this general form here, uh, and so there will be specific, uh, there will be specific p of x and q of x for the Legendre equation of which Legendre polynomials are the solution. Uh, and uh, well, I'll, I'm also going to look at the, the Hermite, the Hermite, uh, the Hermite uh, polynomials polynomials and the uh, Bessel, the Bessel function, the Bessel function. Uh, but anyway, these, um, these, these polynomials sort of fall out of these second order ordinary differential equations uh, and they just happen to be uh, they happen to be orthogonal basis for a, po a polynomial space. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I think I'm starting to ramble now. Uh, uh, I will see you in future videos.